Well, having reviewed uh, the essence of what makes moral character, we now, in this second session, will look at the rebellion of Adam and Eve. We're on point two in your outlines, where it says man rebelled against God by refusing to conform to God's reasonable requirements. And that is, of course, the tragedy of the moral world. We see that God, that man was made perfect with proper inner balance and perspective. He had a right motive and disposition of heart. Uh, Genesis 1.31 And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and morning the sixth day. So when God made man, he was very satisfied that he had done, he, he had created him exactly like he wanted him to be created. And so God can create man with this personality. He can create this uh, put him in a proper environment. But God, even as our creator, because of the nature of morality, he cannot create moral character. God can create innocence in a person, but he could not create holiness because holiness is an evaluation of character. And so he made him with the free will. Now man has to develop his own moral character uh, by his own choices. And so God allowed him and had to um, give him the opportunity to exercise his choice and develop his own moral character. And we see in point one, moral character is what we're doing with our personalities. So he came out of the creative hand of God. Now he has to do something. Moral character cannot be created. It must be man's voluntary choice. And man had every advantage to form his own righteous moral character. Uh, he, his first choice was to say yes to God. God had asked him to name the animals and that was a monumental task. And I believe that didn't happen in one afternoon. No. Uh, because you, how many animals were there? We know that millions have already gone extinct. But there were a lot of animals. And he said he brought the animal to Adam and whatever Adam called him, that was its name. Mm -hmm. So God and man were working together in fellowship. And so he came from a place of innocence to a place of obedience. And so he uh, had, he, he made a choice to love and obey God. So let's verify that. Uh, Genesis 2, 16 through 20. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eat thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for, for him. Mm -hmm. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam, whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So again, we see the fellowship. God formed the animals, brought them to Adam, see what he would name them. And, and God honored his choice. He said, if you want to call that thing a horse, it's going to be a horse. You want to call that a rhinoceros? You know, it's a rhinoceros. And so they're working together in fellowship and harmony. And so he loved and obeyed God. 
So he came from a place of innocence to a place of obedience. See, he was virtuous now. He was holy. He came from innocence to holiness uh, through his obedience, through his fellowship with God. Uh, certainly also in the creation of Eve, Genesis 2, 21 through 24. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh of that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from man. And he brought her to the man and the man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And I understand this is really a loose translation. It's like, he said, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, this is unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I mean, this is my understanding that in the context, it shows great excitement. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, the bone of my bone. <laughs> no, it's, he's excited. You know, because every everything else had a helpmate. And here he is. How how long was it? I don't know, but quite a while. But he says male and female, cow, horse. You know, all these animals. But there was not a helpmate suitable uh -huh. for him. And so when God brought him to him, he said, "Wow, <laughs> this is fantastic." <laughs> For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they sh shall two become one flesh. And so, again, that was divine fellowship, God and man working together. And um, he presented Eve. But a tragic change in divine fellowship took place after the fall. You know, things changed when they rebelled. Genesis 3, 8 through 11. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Yes, yeah, so immediately we see that, um, you know, the fellowship is broken. Mm -hmm. And he is now living in shame. Mm. Because he knew better. He knew he had done wrong. You know, his conscience is very, you know, affecting him. And so they tried to hide from the presence of God. And when God said, where art thou? I don't believe that he was walking around with a white cane. <laughs> you know, he, he's the omniscient God. I think it was a rhetorical question. Like, Adam, I think I got an explanation coming. You know, Adam, what was there in the arrangement that you would fall for this lie of, of the devil? Adam, you know, why? Why did you do it? And of course, there's no logical answer. There's never a logical, reasonable answer for sin. And I believe that's, you know, where art thou, Adam? It wasn't just that he, God did not know, but it, it was deeper than that. Adam, I had such hopes for you. Adam, things could have been so different. Adam, you, you threw away that period of time that we spent sharing with each other, sharing our hearts with each other. You're, you're willing to throw that all away just for a bite of this forbidden fruit? Is that all you, you know, it's... God was heartbroken. He was heartbroken. So knowing good, man partook of the forbidden fruits and was expelled. Genesis 3, 22 through 24. 
And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of, gar of the garden of Eden, cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life yes and so that was the consequence they were separated from god uh, forbidden to partake of the tree of life and you know driven driven out of the garden uh, the relationship of adam and eve radically changed after the fall so it must have been virtuous and unselfish before. We have Genesis 3, 7 through 11. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, made themselves loin coverings. I see these fig leaves as, as you know, the excuses that theologians use to try to cover, you know, and justify try to hide themselves um, from, the, from the eyes of God. And they heard the sound of the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid from the presence of the Lord among the garden. The Lord said, Where art thou? We've read that before, but it, it just, um, it's just devastating. Uh, Eve's reply to Satan indicates her initial obedience to God's command in Genesis 3, 2, and 3. It said, And the woman said to the serpent, from the, tr from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. So she had the truth and exchanged it for the lie of the enemy because it appealed to, to the selfish heart. And that's where the appeal was. And so she exchanged the truth of God for a lie. See, it was an act of the will. Nothing caused her to do it. She wasn't born with a sinful nature it caused her to sin. It was simply the choice of the will to disregard the truth and believe the lie. And the lie appealed to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so the relationship of Adam and Eve radically changed at the fall after the fall, so it was virtuous and unselfish before. So now they begin pointing fingers at each other. God, the woman that thou gavest me, she did make me eat it. And then Genesis 2.25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. She so was virtuous before, but now shame came. They were unashamed. But when sin came, then came guilt and shame. So it was virtuous before, but when sin came, it separated. There's the sin separated between them and God, Adam and Eve. But it also separated the relationship with Adam and Eve was different. Mm -hmm. Now they're pointing fingers. Oh, wow. You made me, you know, the woman thou gave us. You know, mm -hmm. She's the blame. Yeah. Well, Adam, to me, Adam is more guilty than Eve. Yes. The, the serpent didn't beguile Adam. He just says he took it and he ate it. And it must have been a strange fruit. 
Yeah, it doesn't matter what it was. It was it was forbidden. But um, so the relationship with each other was was broken. And they're now pointing fingers at each other. And the harmony, you know, that that mm -hmm. togetherness of one one flesh, of unashamed. Yeah. I, I once heard a preacher say that we need more bold men and less cowards. And he says, and the first coward was Adam. He was there watching. Well, he, he was not willing to take responsibility. Right. You know, and it's his job. On. It was his job. He could have stopped it. And, uh, yeah. and uh, even if he couldn't stop her to, you know, not partake with her. Right. But he did it knowingly and willingly. Mm -hmm. uh, point number C, uh, Adam and Eve freely rebelled against God by blinding their minds to obvious truths of the relationship. It was a positive act of rebellion, Genesis 3, 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desir desirable to make one wise. She took from his fruit and ate, gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Took it, ate it. I said, don't eat. So they took it. See, it's direct disobedience. It's rebellion against God. We call it the fall, but no, it's, it's rebellion. It was a violation of a known command. It was not any kind of weakness or deficiency. And God had told them in Genesis 3.3, 3, don't eat it. You can eat everything else. And see, this is the leniency of God. <laughs> you know, that they were surrounded with plenty, but the leniency of God was, you know, you need to make a choice. I want you to be virtuous. I can't create you virtuous. But I have to allow you to exercise your freedom. And so he gave him just one choice. Mm -hmm. Eat from everything else. I'm just giving you one, one choice. Don't eat from that one tree. There's plenty out there. <laughs> There's one choice. No, we want that. See, it's a deliberate act of rebellion. Violation of a known mm -hmm. command to replace God with self-gratification with self-centeredness. And so the inner balance of self-control was disrupted. Now emotions are reigning deep. Adam and Eve immediately sought to excuse themselves and to blame God. But Adam was not deceived, according to 1 Timothy 2.14. Let's read that. Fourteen, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Fifteen? Yes. No, that was the verse. Okay. Again, the tempter dealt with Eve, but this verse says, you know, Adam, you're even more responsible. You know, you're not deceived. You just, it's out and out rebellion against Almighty God. And again, he's pointing the finger at some somebody else. Uh, Eve blames Satan as personified in the serpent, and in effect, uh, blame God. Genesis three thirteen is Eve's response. Then the Lord God said to the woman, "What is this that you have done?" And the woman said, "The serpent deceived me." And I ate. So basically, God, it's your fault. If you wouldn't allow that servant to come in here, it never would have happened. <laughs> you know, she's she's essentially blaming, blaming God. She's not taking responsibility. She's not saying, 
you know, you told me not to eat it, but I went ahead and did it anyway. Please forgive me. No, it's, it's always, mm, <laughs> you know, with that, that prideful, selfish heart of not willing to accept responsibility. So the inner balance of self-control was disrupted. Emotions reigned. They blamed each other. Uh, Eve was deceived at the, motion, the moment of indulgence. You know, when she made that choice, you know, she was deceived. She exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We've read the first Timothy. Let's do second Corinthians 11.3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Yes. So, but she was deceived when she, when she took. Point four, this deception was voluntary after rejection of moral light and understanding. Point five, God will never permit excessive temptation to anyone who is responsive to his moral light. We have a few scriptures here. It's good to remind us of this. God will not per permit excessive temptation. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. One you know, I'm sure. But we will not boast of things without... Is that 10, 10, 13? 1 Corinthians. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will also, with the temptation, provide the way of escape that you may also endure it. So he says, no temptation is ever going to come upon you that is absolutely irresistible for you. Mm -hmm. And he says, God is going to provide a way of escape uh, from every temptation. Mm -hmm. He will provide the way of escape. Mm -hmm. So what is the way of escape that God provides for every temptation that you'll ever face in life? What is the way of escape? Oh, prayer and resistance. Mm -hmm. It's your God-given ability to say no. no. That is the way of escape God has provided for every temptation that you and I will ever face in our life. Hallelujah. And Adam had that opportunity. He did too. Himself. No temptation will ever overtake you, but such as is common to man. You know, we all face the same temptation, but God is faithful. <coughs> He'll not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you're able, but will, with the temptation, provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And the way of escape. No. No, I'm not going to do this thing. I, I think of Joseph. If anyone was ever tempted, it was Joseph. You know, 18-year-old boy, hormones... Mm -hmm. Raging like any other 18 year old boy, and he's a slave in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar goes on vacation, goes on a business trip. Uh, the wife tries to seduce him. He's a slave. Mm -hmm. He's duty bound to obey the mistress. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the wife of the house says, Come on in the bedroom, the husband's away, let's, let's have some fun. If there's ever a temptation for a young man, that would be it. But he said, no. No. How can I do this thing and sin against God? You know, and he was delivered from that temptation. He ran. He left his jacket in the, in the bedroom, but he was out of there. Cost him many years, several years in prison. But God provided a way of escape. He said, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do this thing. Sin against Almighty God. That, that's very challenging. 
to me, you know, because of their, like I said, if there's every uh, tough temp temptation uh, for a young man, that would have been it. I said, no, I cannot sin against God, let alone Potiphar. No, Peter, I, I think that, um, yes, he had hormones, but like every every young person does. Yes. God made us that way. But yeah. I believe he, he was do, just keeping those things under control, and yes. he knew how to possess his body and holiness and righteousness. So when the temptation came, it wasn't. It wasn't the temptation right. to him because, that it was because to he her. was over here already. Yeah, that was his. That's honor. right. He was he was under the hand. Whereas submitted to God, you know, mm -hmm. the the unbeliever would be over here, and and you know that's what they live for. And his heart mm -hmm. was um, was fixed on keeping the commandments of God, like David said, "Thy word have I hid in my heart that mm -hmm. I might not sin against." Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. Let's look at a couple of other of these scripture. Matthew thirteen fifteen. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, <laughs> and I should heal them. Yeah, they've closed their eyes. See, that's that's voluntary. The voluntary action. Uh, John 12, 35 and 36. <clears throat> then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while we while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. Mm. For he that walks in darkness knows not where he goes. Mm. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. Amen. Amen. Right, point number six. So mankind must take the full blame for his rebellion and sin. Hebrews ten twenty six. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Yeah, so it's talking about willful uh, disobedience. You know, it's extremely, extremely serious. So man must take full responsibility. You know, I think that's a prerequisite to, to repentance. Because if you're not, if you're still blaming, how can you be guilty in Repentant. Yeah, you have to own it. Yeah, yeah. That's how I see it. Okay, at our point three, we'll, we'll go on here mm -hmm. because of our time. The old there's eleven distinct Hebrew words in the Old Testament describing sin. You know, just so that we will not be confused or or miss what it is. And under each of these words, you know, there'd be many scripture, but in our notes, we just have one scripture. If you look in this book here, well, there'll be a whole lot more. But there were 11 Hebrew words, and so we'll just look at these real quickly. Uh, they're words with slightly different shades of meaning in the Hebrew, but I think what we're going to see as we go through these they all describe a voluntary action, a choice of the will that we can say yes to or no to. Uh, Ezekiel 18.20 the, the soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Yes, yeah, so individual accountability in that word was to miss the mark. It's these 
And God wants us to aim our arrow, you know, at love. The sinner, you know, aims at this target with his bow. And so it's, it's to miss the mark because we're aiming at the wrong target. You know, that's why we miss the mark. It's not that your arrow just comes slightly short. It's, hey, you're aiming at the wrong target. Wow. B, uh, to act perversely or to twist and distort moral character. And this is sometimes translated as iniquity, Daniel 9.5. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts. And from thy judgments. Yeah, so in that one verse, it probably used three different Hebrew words uh, describing sin. Uh, to transgress or to break away from just authority, to be contrary. Isaiah 1 2. <coughs> Knox knows his owner, the ass is master crib, but my people don't know. You know, they've rebelled against me. D. A refusal to obey God, Joshua 24, 14, and 15. That's the one where he says, you know, you can serve them, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so the sin is a refusal to serve God. E, fact treacherously or deceitfully, usually rendered trespass, Joshua 7, 1. The sons of Israel acted treacherously in regard to the thing under the ban. For Achan, the son of Camry, the son of... Anyway, the point we're making, they acted treacherously. You know, and they stole the item. They were not to steal anything out of Jericho. And this guy took it, put it under, under the house, his tent, and it brought judgment on the whole people of God. So he acted treacherously. Uh, to refuse to obey or hearken or refusal to listen. Numbers 9, oh, I'm sorry, Nehemiah 9, 16 and 17. Nehemiah. They, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn. They would not listen to thy commandments, and they refused to listen. They did not remember the wondrous deeds which thou had performed among them, so they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to, to their slavery in Egypt. You know, they refused to listen. They became stubborn. See, it's an act of the will. They weren't born stubborn. They became stubborn. Uh, to be wicked or impious. First Kings eight forty seven. take thought in the land where they have been taken captive, and repent and make supplication to thee in the land of those who have taken them captive, saying, We have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have acted wickedly. So the word translated wickedly. Uh, J, to live worthlessly or, or without any worthy purpose. Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, 
and the unrighteous man his thoughts, mm. and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Yes. And then uh, Genesis 6, 5. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. They were evil to spoil or dash to pieces the moral wealth worth that God had intended. That's a strong word, mm -hmm. to dash to pieces. So we're a vessel, you know, the potter's clay. He makes us in a beautiful vessel and Sin is take it and just, you know, throw it down. So in all of these words in the Old Testament here, do you see one of those verses that ever justifies sin or gives an excuse? or uh, no. no, it's always a voluntary. Uh, there's no idea of causation or something forcing you to do it. It's just an action of doing what you know is wrong. So we come to the New Testament. The New Testament has eight Greek words, a slightly different change of meaning. The first one is to err from the mark. It's again the same as the Hebrew. It's to miss the mark. Uh, and again, it's not just falling a little bit short. You know, you didn't aim quite high enough. It's You're shooting at the wrong target. Mm -hmm. B, to transgress, to fall aside or deviate from the right path of life, to stumble. Ephesians 2.1. And you are dead in your transgressions and in your sins. Point C, another Greek word to trans to transgress or to step by the side of the prescribed path of truth. Hebrews two two. For if the word spoken through the angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, how shall we escape? So use the word transgression, disobedience. Uh, D, to be lawless. This is a refusal to conform to divine law. Matthew 7, 23. Coming on the mount. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Yeah, iniquity, the lawlessness. To disobey or be disobedient, to disbelieve or a refusal to believe. Romans 2 verse 8. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Yes, a refusing belief and being disobedient. Uh, to do wrong, to be unjust or unrighteous, to refuse to do what is right. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Be not deceived, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. The unrighteous. G. To be godly or to act <clears throat> impiously without a reverential awe toward God. 1 Timothy 1, 9. 
knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. Mm. Wow. And the final Greek word is to be evil, wicked or depraved in mind and heart. John 3.19 Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Amen. Do you find anything in either the Hebrew or the Greek that justifies this rebellion? That we're caused to do it? That it's the result of society? It's because we weren't properly potty trained or <laughs> whatever the excuse might be. Do you no excuse. So point five, here's our conclusion. All sin is a wrong ultimate choice to seek our own happiness supremely. Sin is a wrong voluntary attitude or a wrong motive of heart. First Kings eleven, nine through eleven. Now the Lord is angry with Solomon because his heart turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded, commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. To me, that's just so absolutely tragic. A man that had lived most of his life over here started out good. And then, and then went over onto that side. You know, and that's the Lord speaking to him. He said, and I can just see God just shaking his head and weeping <coughs> over his son that had started so well. Okay. Let's look at the Hebrews 3, 7 through 15. Therefore, just the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me by testing me, and they saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation <clears throat> and said they always go astray in their heart and they do not know my ways. As they swear my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let's see, how far do I go? Uh, take care, brethren, that there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. So I'm speaking to brethren. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today. Lest any one of you, brethren, be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm to the end. We'll hold fast to this, he's saying. And he's addressing brethren. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very, very serious matter. Mm -hmm. So it involves the whole personality, leaves no room for simultaneous actions from an opposite motive. It says one or the other. And there's no one saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. uh, see, this wrong attitude of heart has been continuous from the dawn of moral accountability. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what tears people up. You know, because they might admit some of what we're talking about, when, but when you come to this part, they say, no way. I've done some good. You know, and God mm -hmm. is just, and at the end, he's going to weigh the good against the bad. <laughs> you know, and I, I think I'm going to be okay. Right on the curve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not as bad as those people mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and I, I think I'm going to make it. But we have a category of verses here that says they're continuous because once this choice is made, every other choice that comes from that heart is the means chosen to further the end for which the life has been pledged. Let's, let's run these. Uh, Psalm 14, 1 and 3. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There's none who does good. The Lord has looked down from heavens upon the sons of men to see if there's any who understand, who seek after God. They've all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There's no one who does good, not even one. Kind of a humbling verse. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah 64 verse 6 verse 6 but we are all as an unclean thing and all our un and all our righteousness are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away yes and again, it's referring to the, the, the sinful nation. It's not referring to the person over here on this side. It's referring to the selfish, that all of their righteousness is sinful, is like um, dirty, sinful rags. Uh, the Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yes. And it's speaking of this type of heart. The wicked. This heart is not deceitful. It's truthful. It doesn't try to deceive anybody. You know, it's in right relationship with God. It's walking in the light as he is in the light. So it's this heart that's deceitful above all things. And the, the main target of their deceit is themselves. You know, they try to, they deceive themselves into thinking they're on the way to heaven uh, because uh, my good outweighs my bad. Mm -hmm. Deceit, the heart is deceitful above all things. And again, it, it's not so much deceiving others uh, we deceive. tend to try to deceive ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's sad. It's very mm -hmm. sad, but I believe it's the reality of things. Mm -hmm. I heard someone say that that's the hardest deceit to come out of. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. Because we think we're so great and mighty and on the right track. Mm -hmm. And we're not near as bad as those people across the street. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Romans 3 10 through 12 as, as it is written there is none righteous no not one there is none that understands there is none that seeks after God they are all gone out of the way they are together become unprofitable there is none that does good no, not one. Uh -huh. yeah. As long as their heart is over there, there's none who does good. No, not mm -hmm. one. Hallelujah. I thank God for his gospel that transforms a sinner. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know that there is a way to come over here, and that's that's a cross. Great crossover. Uh, six, Romans 6, 16 and 17. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God, he thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Right. 
See, and it speaks of obedience, yeah. obeyed from the heart. And then finally, Ephesians 1, 1 and 2, or 1 and 3. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and who are faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I have the right one, Ephesians 1. Mm -hmm. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. I'm going to put a question mark on that. I don't see how that applies. I might have miscopied that from the original. So point number six, another conclusion. Men are the authors of their own rebellion against God and are fully to blame for the entrance of sin in the world and as persistent perpetuation. Yeah, we're, we're not responsible for coming into the world, but we are responsible for passing it on to other generations. A, sin did not enter the world because man was created deficient in any way. He was not created deficient. Perfect heredity, perfect environment, probably the most intelligent being to walk the face of this earth. It was a choice. You know, God's love is, is going to produce the best. And, and so it was not that he was created deficient. Uh, point two. God's creation results from <laughs> intelligence and wisdom. And so love would produce the, the, the best possible um, system that he could come up with. And let's look at Acts 17.42. 17.24. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 17-24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. Yes, he is Lord, Lord of all. Point, or point number B, sin did not enter the world because it was God's will that it should. And I've heard some theologians say that, you know, that this was somehow God's will so that, you know, he could, he could um, exhibit his character of grace and mercy. And, uh, but sin is never God's will. No. It is no. never God's will. Ephesians 2, verse 22. His will for us is holiness and righteousness. In whom you are also being built up together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. See, that's His will for us that we be the habitation of God mm. uh, through the Holy Spirit. B, sin did not enter the world because it was God's will that it should. And we look at that. Holiness and happiness are God's will for moral beings. And let's look at 1 John 2.17. 3.17? Yes. Yes. Wait a second. Yeah, first John two seventeen is what I have. Is that three? That's number oh, oh you're in two. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. Yes, yeah, so that's God's will for us that we walk with him, that we obey him. 
Three, it is God's will that all men should be saved. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6. I think we're familiar with that verse. Mm This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So that's God's will. Mm-hmm. You know, your your parents, we're all parents. Do we desire our kids to suffer misfortune, uh, to ruin their lives? You know, that's not our desire as parents. You know, we love our kids. We want the very best for our kids. We're made in the image of God. You know, and how much more would he love us? So it's God's will that all should be saved. So sin did not enter the world because it's God's will. Never, never, never. It's never his will. See, sin did not enter the world because God failed to exert every effort to prevent it. He warned Adam and Eve of the consequences of disobedience. He said, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What more could have he done? I mean, he could put a fence around the tree so high they could never touch it, but would that accomplish the development of the moral character? No, they, they, it had, the love has to come from the heart. You cannot force love. You cannot cause love. It's got to be the free will choice saying, I love you, Lord. I'm going to obey you. So God warned Adam and Eve the consequences. The man is represented as resisting these Pressures continually. Um, Genesis 6, 3. And because of time, we won't look up all, all of these. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Yeah, so it wasn't God's desire that the spirit would strive with man. You know, and man's striving against the Spirit. And the Spirit's trying to enlighten him, trying to lead him in the truth, trying to bring him. You know, about that time, Enoch lived. And Enoch made a choice to obey God. And it says in Hebrews 11, 5, that before God took him, he obtained the testimony that he was pleasing to God. So here... In the midst of all the sin and confusion, here's a man who said, I'm putting God first in my life. Noah did the same thing. He was the only righteous man in in his generation. So man is represented as resisting these. Uh, Let's look at the New Testament, Matthew 23, 33 through 35. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Those are certainly true words, but um, it wasn't Matthew 23. It's very nice. Serpents, but you very nice. Serpents, you generation of vipers. Yeah. You want to read it, Doris? Yeah, you serpents, you generation of viper, vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets 
and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge with yours in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Bar Barcaeus, mm -hmm. who you slew between the temple and the altar. I think that was it, right? Yeah, and the point making this been made here is man is represented as resisting mm -hmm. those continually, and that, that certainly is a good verse to back that up. And there's several others, but because of time, we'll, you can look them up later. Uh, point three, God pleads with man as evidence of a concern for his welfare. And we have several verses here that, that just show the bleeding heart of God pleading with man. I, I like the one in Micah 6, 2 and 3, because it reminds me of a court setting. Micah 6, 2 and 3. Listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord, you enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a controversy against his people. Even with Israel, he'll, he will dispute. So he's got his witnesses lined up. You know, you mountains, you saw it. You know, your witnesses. My people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. Isn't that wow. pathetic? It is. Yeah, pathetic. It is. It's heartbreaking. It is. It got, you know, I've got a controversy with you. We got these witnesses around. You know, give give an account of yourself. How have I worried you? What was so difficult? My demanding impossibilities? What's so wrong with love? Mm -hmm. What's so bad about truthfulness? And so we have these verses where he's absolutely pleading with man. Uh, we know the Matthew twenty three thirty seven. How often I want to gather your children together under my wings like a hen does your chicks, but you would not. I mean, he's pleading with them. His heart contained unmanifested blessings. He would have healed more. He would have saved more. He would have cast out more demons, but they would not. Couldn't do many miracles in his hometown because of their unbelief. Four, a man has limited God's love and deeply grieved him. Let's look at 7841. We read this last night, but to me it's such a powerful verse. Um, 7841. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness, grieved him in the desert. Again and again they tempted God. As I said before, I believe the temptation was to just say, I'm done. I'm done. You know, I've, I've taken all that I can take. But see, love, love goes... Up. About, it conquers those feelings. Limited the Holy One of Israel. See, that's what sin does. Limits God. It limits how, how He can bless us. It limits how He can use us. Hmm. D. The grief and disappointment that sin has brought to God proves that he has done all possible to prevent sin from entering the world. He would never author his own unhappiness. And yet it broke his heart when he saw the rebellion of man. So man was created with the responsibility to form his own moral character. And sin is when he refuses to do that. 
So, Father, we thank you for this lesson, Lord, a very sobering look at the Word of God. And, Father, as we have gone through Scripture after Scripture, we do not find any excuses. We do not find any justification given for why man would rebel against you. We don't find evidence that that he's been born with some kind of impediment that just compels him uh, to rebel against God. It's a choice. Father, we have seen that plain and simple through your holy word. But Father, we are so grateful that although we may be surrounded by temptations, you make a way of escape against every temptation that any of us will ever face, and that is the ability that you have given to each one of us to rise up against the devil and his temptations and say, no, I will serve the Lord. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, may that be the confession of each one of us as we go forth from this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.